Whether we're talking about chanting, singing, drumming, or playing very fancy Baroque-era pipe organs, religion is infused with music. Of course, so is the rest of life, from elevator music playing in the background to the radio blasting from the guy's car next to you in traffic. But what's the reason for all this noise making? Scholars in many fields, from philosophy to biology to cognitive psychology, have tackled this question. And one answer keeps turning up. Music is something that bonds people together. To be more specific, music bonds people quickly, regardless of their social roles or pre-existing relationships. And even more so than language, music directly affects our emotions. From an evolutionary perspective, these traits might make music the ideal tool for bringing people together in rituals, powerfully uniting participants who could otherwise be strangers. This is Dr. Patrick Savage. Dr. Savage is a comparative musicologist at Keio University in Japan. He's someone who studies the similarities and differences in music across different cultures. Unlike many musicologists, though, he's also interested in the biological and evolutionary foundations of music, answering the question, why do we do music? On the surface, music doesn't make a lot of sense from an evolutionary perspective. It doesn't help us fight off predators or forage for food, but Savage argues that music is a co-evolved system for social bonding. That is, our musical abilities, including rhythmic timekeeping, perception of distinct pitches, and strong connections between the audio and motor centers of the brain, evolved in tandem with human culture, developing over millennia to help our ancestors build relationships relationships and societies that, by the standards of primates, were growing rapidly larger. Social bonds are vital for human beings because we depend on each other to survive. To a much greater extent than any other animals, we learn all of our complicated skills and knowledge from each other. This includes how to speak the language we're born into, but also how to use technology like a bow and arrow to how to manipulate a touchscreen on a smartphone. Humans also typically live in larger groups than our closest animal relatives. With larger group sizes and more dependence on relationships for survival, we need the ability to keep track of and manage a lot of social bonds. The Oxford evolutionary anthropologist Robin Dunbar argues that while our great ape relatives mostly rely on one-on-one -on -one grooming to nurture social bonds, this strategy would be prohibitively time-consuming for humans. Our larger group sizes and wide-ranging friendship networks mean that we need to spend virtually all our waking hours grooming each other. If we relied on grooming to keep up our social circles, we would not last very long as a species. Instead, as Dunbar suggests, we developed language. Sound travels in every direction at once, allowing us to share social experiences even with others who aren't sitting right next to us. It also allows more than two individuals to participate. Language then was one part of the tool set that allowed our early ancestors to scale up their social interactions. But while language is good Good for some aspects of social bonding, it has some limitations. For instance, conversations are usually limited to a turn-taking structure. One person talks, then the other, then another, and then so on. Too many people speaking at once makes it hard to understand what's going on. So language is not something we can do altogether at once. It requires careful inhibition and control. But music, on the other hand, does not have these liabilities of language. It doesn't need a turn-taking structure. In fact, it's the opposite. The most basic form of music is probably just people collectively dancing to a shared rhythm, maybe using their hands to clap the time. In this kind of dance, everyone moves to the same beat at once. The rhythm is predictable because it's a regular beat, so it doesn't take a lot of cognitive effort to keep up. Participants are united in space and time. This unique feature of music, to physically link people together using sound may explain why our early ancestors developed musical abilities over evolutionary time. Music may have even evolved before language. But the evolutionary story of music is much more complicated and interesting than competition or survival of the fittest. Savage and his colleagues see the evolution of music as a kind of niche construction in which an animal's behavior alters its own environment and then over evolutionary time 
time scales, the animal becomes specifically adapted to the environment that it created. For example, beavers build dams that then produce enormous changes in river ecosystems. The new ecosystem then exerts new evolutionary selection pressures that prompts beavers to become specialized for the pond-like environment that their dams created. Over eons, these pressures have led to adaptations such as webbed feet, a paddle-like tail, and oily secretions that keep beaver fur waterproof. And to be clear, humans are not the only creatures that can follow rhythm. So perhaps you've seen videos of Snowball the Dancing Cockatoo dancing to uh, things like its favorite song, which is Backstreet, uh, Backstreet Boys, Backstreet's Back. It can synchronize really well. It can do, in fact, do these complicated like dance moves at like different phases, kind of like, kind of like strutting around. It's pretty impressive because people used to think only humans can synchronize to a beat. But unlike cockatoos, humans created a new cultural niche. Our ancestors lived in a new kind of environment, filled with highly sociable interactions, intensive learning from others, and a high rate of creativity, tool use, and cultural innovation. When they discovered a new behavior that happened to benefit social bonding, the novel behavior quickly caught on and became part of our cultural environment. And in this case, that new behavior was making noise in a a regular, predictable beat, or using the voice to sing discrete pitches or notes. Our ancestors became genetically adapted for this behavior that was originally only a learned innovation. We gained a stronger ability to detect and synchronize to rhythmic beats, and grew more robust connections between the audio and motor systems in the brain. Our DNA learned how to learn music. For you biology nerds out there, this is the Baldwin effect. The process of becoming more genetically adapted over time to perform a novel behavior that was originally only learned. One of the features of music that stands out the most is rhythm. Most kinds of music are based on what musicologists call an isochronous background beat. That is a beat that's simple and steady, not broken up into metrical divisions. Musicians also might add complex meters and additional rhythms, but the main beat makes it easy to predict and synchronize with the rhythm as a whole. In turn, psychologists have found that participating in rhythmic synchrony, or keeping together in time, powerfully affects bonding, making people trust one another, cooperate, and feel more similar to one another. For example, in cadence marching, soldiers march to a steady beat, often accompanied by a group chant. You've seen this in countless movies, the ones where young, raw military recruits suffer through miles-long runs while a drill sergeant yells rhymes at them. Well, it turns out that all of that marching and rhythm might actually serve a purpose. One study had non-military participants walk around a college campus, either in synchrony, that is marching in cadence, or in a control group at their own pace. Members of groups that marched in cadence together later showed significantly more generosity and trust toward one another, compared to those who walked around together but without synchronizing their footsteps. Rhythmic marching may be one way that military units create unity and willingness to sacrifice for other soldiers in a unit, but the benefits of rhythm are not limited to the military. Other studies have found that synchrony makes people feel more strongly affiliated with other participants. This may be the Baldwin effect in action. As human culture developed, human DNA eventually altered to make us better at rhythmic processing and timekeeping, but also more prone to produce rhythmic actions that others could find easy to synchronize with. This ability could then provide a shortcut way to stimulate neural rewards and make us more cooperative, generous, and friendly with each other. It even helps numb pain. Other experiments have found that rowing, drumming, and dancing together in time made participants more resistant to pain, indicating that synchrony stimulates the body to release pain-killing endorphins. Now, of course, music today consists of a lot more than just beats and clapping. There are melodies, harmonies, scales, vocals, and lots more. And some music doesn't seem to have a rhythm at all. So what gives? As Dr. Savage explains, music as we know it is a cultural product that's based on, but not limited to, a few core evolutionarily based foundations. Rhythmic timekeeping and synchrony are part of the evolutionary base for music. 
Actual music as it's played and enjoyed in real cultures takes these basic foundations and then extrapolates wildly on them, producing new forms of sound that may have little to do with the original functions that they evolved to support, specifically social bonding. This experimentation is analogous to painting. Our fingers and hands evolved to grasp and manipulate objects like tools, but now some of us use them to hold paintbrushes and palettes. Hands did not evolve for painting, but we now use them to paint with. In the same way, our musical abilities did not evolve to be played alone or listened to on a headset, but many of us now use these abilities beyond the original function of social bonding. What this means is that music is still evolving. We're finding new uses and expressions for it. Now, to return to the beginning, music is something that bonds people quickly. Some researchers call this the icebreaker effect. For example, one study tracked members of adult learning classes. Some classes focused on choir singing, others on arts and crafts or writing, and they found that members of the choir bonded with each other much more quickly than members of the other classes. Even though by the end of the seven month experimental period, all classes had bonded with each other about equally. So this might suggest that music seems to cause a sharp, sudden jump in bonding, which later levels out. By contrast, other group activities cause slow but gradual increases in bonding. The icebreaker effect may indicate that music and dancing evolved specifically to help people bond during times of social transition or gatherings between far-flung members of the same group that were spread out over a wide geographic area. Traditional human societies such as hunter-gatherers may look technologically simple, but their social structures are often complex, with many overlapping clans, initiation groups, kin relationships, and other subgroups that affect who people can marry where they can live, and so on. Scientists call this a multi-level social structure because it's hierarchical. So-and-so is a member of this band, that clan, and that tribe. In this kind of social structure, people might disperse to their own subgroups, but then gather back again in larger groups every once in a while, usually for a big festival, ritual, or wedding. And what happens at these events? music and dancing. One basic role for music then may be to help quickly re-bond people who belong to the same overarching umbrella group, but who separate or disperse to different corners of the region most of the time. Music might also help rapidly bond members of different groups that come together in a new relationship, such as when families are united by a wedding, or when two tribes make a treaty to stop a war. In contemporary world religions, synchronous actions during rituals, such as chanting or hymn singing might take advantage of these same evolutionary effects to reunite the congregation week after week, helping people to set aside their everyday roles as members of different families, residents of different neighborhoods, or workers in different jobs, and instead re-enter a shared identity as members of the same religious community. You could even think of synchrony as a kind of cultural device or cultural tool for jumping between different kinds of social states. In one state, people have different roles and functions within a social structure that's pretty well defined. The anthropologist Victor Turner calls this structure. When structure is strong, norms and obligations guide our behavior. We do what we ought to do because of our role. So for example, chefs in a restaurant kitchen cook food and pass it on to the servers. The different workers coordinate closely, but only because it's their job, not because they feel some inner urge to do it. Or an airline pilot coordinating with the first officer and coordinating with the control tower. They're all operating in a strong structure with clearly delineated norms and obligations guiding their behavior. But other social states don't have so many distinctions. Social states when categories, norms, obligations are not as salient or important. Turner calls this state anti-structure. Music, synchrony, and dance may be one gateway to get to anti-structure. Remember that music directly triggers the neural reward system, and so we experience an intrinsic urge to move along to a rhythm. In fact, you might even sometimes find yourself tapping your foot to a beat without noticing it. So when we synchronize in rhythm, we're motivated by something more basic than social obligations. Yet, because we're synced up, we're still physically coordinating. In fact, we're probably more coordinated when doing music than those chefs in the restaurant kitchen. Music can be a tool for bonding people directly unmediated by roles and rules about how to behave. 
This pivoting function of music, allowing us to pivot between structure and anti-structure, might help us understand why ecstatic rituals driven by music and dancing are often especially popular among people who are marginalized, that is, people who might want to transcend the regular day-to-day -day social structure. For example, Haitian vodou is especially popular among Haitian women and lower classes in Haiti. In vodou ceremonies, people dance rhythmically to a driving beat, often all night long, while different spirits, or lua, take over their bodies. Similar ecstatic religious traditions are seen worldwide. Czar cults in North Africa, or Korean shamanism, these all center on ecstatic rhythmic dance and spirit possession while appealing especially to marginalized groups. For some, dance and rhythm may be some sort of cultural tool in which everyday roles fade away, temporarily replaced by a new, more seemingly authentic identity simply as members of the dancing group. People might even enter trance states that offer a doorway to completely different temporary roles. It's probably not a coincidence that spirit possession rituals worldwide almost always hinge on rhythmic dance and drumming. Of course, in everyday life, music is most often something we just do because we like it. Evolutionary explanations don't mean that we're sitting there calculating how to bond quickly with other people, or temporarily cancel the social structure each time we play air guitar. Instead, evolutionary explanations for music explain why we have the abilities and motivations that make music possible to begin with. Other animals don't make music for fun the way we do, which suggests that music co-evolved with other parts of human culture. It's possible, maybe even likely, that this co-evolved cultural package included behaviors such as rituals which we modern humans now call religious. If so, then maybe we can classify musicology with religious studies. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to dig a little bit deeper into this topic, then I've sat down with the writer and researcher of this episode, my friend and colleague, Dr. Connor Wood. He's an expert on synchrony and religion. I published the full interview on my second channel. The link is in the show notes below. If you'd like to see more experts like this on my channel, the best way to make that happen is to join our Patreon community. So if you'd like to support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash religion for breakfast. Thanks everyone.